So we, we finished last week where David ended up marrying Nabal's wife or Nabal's widow, um, Abigail. We found that rather harsh and horrible character who was, it would appear, had been corrupted by his own wealth. He thought that because he was rich in the things of this world that he could literally do and say what he wanted to do and say and that nobody would call him to account for it. And yet at the end of the day, God calls us to account for all things. Thank God for our Saviour Jesus that our sins are forgiven and set aside and we won't be called account for them. So then we find here at chapter 26, we don't know the time scale, we don't know how long between the end of chapter 25 and 26 here, but Nabal has died, David has married Abigail, he's got another wife as well, and he would go on to have another one as well, which, you know, is not particularly the godly way to do things. Uh, indeed, I don't think that many countries in this world actually realise that, that the one woman, one man marriage comes out of the Bible. Otherwise, they might ban it. You know, it's, uh, that is the technical definition of God's definition of marriage is one man and one woman. It's no one man and one man or one woman and one woman. It's a man and a woman. And irrespective of whatever the world throws at us, God will never recognise marriage other than through one man and one woman. So we get to the start of this. I'll just read the first few verses of this at chapter 26. The Ziphites went to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hachilah, which faces Jeshimon? So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with his 3,000 chosen men of Israel to search there for David. Saul made his camp beside the road on the hill of Hachilah, facing Jeshimon. And David stayed in the desert. When he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. So a couple of chapters back we saw how David had been in the cave and Saul had come in to relieve himself and David had had, had the opportunity and was encouraged by his own followers to kill Saul and refused to lay hands on the Lord's anointed. He refused to put hands on somebody that God had chosen to, to lead Israel, irrespective of the fact of whether this guy had got it totally wrong. This was still God's man in that situation and David would not put a hand on him. There's a bit of difference with Nabal right enough, but anyway, we'll not go that, we'll, we'll stick to the point here. But David found himself being chased once again, although he'd cut the hem off his soul's robe and had said to Saul, why are you chasing me? Why are you after me? Why do you want to kill me? And of course, a few chapters back, we got this kind of false repentance from Saul. Oh, I'm sorry, David, you know, it'll never happen again. And here we are, a couple of chapters later. And Saul, once again, he's going to look for David. Now, if you were going to look for somebody to reconcile with them and to make amends with somebody, would you really take 3,000 armed men with you? I mean, it does seem a bit over the top, if you want to call it that. So it was fairly clear to David that Saul was not intent on peacemaking, but on warmongering. And so we find here that David's scouts had found out where, and I'm just going to paraphrase through this chapter, they'd found out where Saul was camped. And in that camp, beside the hill at Hakala, um, they, had, they had built a, a sort of... A, in these days with the chariots and the wagons, because you can imagine there's a fair few wagons of food, etc., that has to be carried along with an army of 3,000 people. So they had wagon loads of stuff, and what they did was they built it almost like the cowboys and Indians think. They built a, kind of, a, a round circular palisade with the wagons, and everybody camped inside that, and Saul camped right in the middle of that. And in some of your translations, it might say that Saul slept in the trench, or inside the trench. And the trench really was referring to the great wheel marks that these wagons made. And it, wasn't, it didn't mean that he actually slept in the wagon tracks, it just meant that he slept inside, in other words, protected by these wagons. So, in case that was in your translation. So we find here that Saul's in the middle of this and it would appear that Saul's a bit blasé about the whole thing even although the Philistines are a bit active at this time. Either that 
Saul's a bit blasé and, and David manages to sneak into his camp or once again God's at work. And sometimes at the end of the day we lay things down to men's errors and really at the end of the day God's at work in their lives. And David decided that he would once again give Saul another chance at reconciliation. So he asked Ahimelech and Abishai who were, Ahimelech was the priest and Abishai was obviously a, a close friend and confidant of David's, if they would come with him and break into Saul's camp. Now, that doesn't sound like a very clever idea to do, but somehow they managed it. And it does tell us here that God virtually put the camp to sleep, that they were quiet, that they were rested. There doesn't seem to have been, if there were any guards and on the outer perimeter of the camp then they didn't seem to be able to see David and Abishai coming into the camp and of course when they got to the centre they found Saul sleeping on his bed with his spear stuck into the ground and his water bottle standing beside it and Abishai said to David I'll go and kill him this is, this is God doing your work for you I'll go and kill. you don't need to kill him David I'll kill him and sometimes we get into that place where we think, you know, um, we want to get a job done, but we'll get somebody else to do it. You know, it's a bit, a bit defiling in our hands, but we'll, uh, but we'll get somebody else talked into it to do it. But David said, no, this is not God's way of doing things. I want to give Saul another chance here. And so he took, in fact, Abishai said, he says, I'll take his own spear and put it through him. The very spear that Saul had thrown at David on a few occasions was standing there and would have been very easy for David just to pick up and thrust into Saul's bosom. But he stole the spear and he stole the water bottle and they sneaked back out of camp and he called and he went to the other side of the valley and he called to Saul and he shouted in Saul. It must have been fairly close. I mean, you can't shout that far. In the morning he called out and he said, uh, Saul, where, where's all your guards? He says, nobody's looking after you. He says, I, I sneaked into your camp last night and stole your stuff. And nobody said a word to us. And of course Abner, who was Saul's general at that point in time, he cursed David and said, don't you dare talk to the king like that. Who are you to talk? And David pulled up the spear in the water bottle and he said, well, Abner, who are you? You're the guy that's supposed to be looking after your king, so where did I get these? How come you're supposed to be the one that's looking after him and it's me that comes in, has an opportunity to kill him and refuses to take it because I want to make peace with the man. I want to know why he's wanting to kill me. And of course Saul heard this and Saul shouted out, Is that you, my son, David? In this sort of fake repentance way. And so at that point in time, we come to an end of that and David went back his own way and Saul went back his own way. Saul said to him at the end of chapter 26, Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You will do great things and surely triumph. So, Saul, so David went in his way and Saul returned home. So there was to be no reconciliation. It was fairly obvious there was to be no reconciliation. And yet, often we find ourselves in that situation where we try to reconcile and other people don't want to reconcile with us. You know, it tells us in Romans 12 that where it's possible, as far as it depends on us, to live at peace with everybody. But sometimes people don't want to live at peace with us. But it doesn't, it shouldn't stop us trying to live at peace with people. We can't just walk away and pretend that nothing's happening. And so verse uh, chapter 27 here. David thought to himself, in verse 1, I shall be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hand. So David and his 600 men went with him and left. They went over to Achish, the son of Mahoch, the king of Gath. And David and his men settled in Gath with Achish. Each man had his family with him, and David had his two wives. So once again we see this 
Same situation developing. David is David is falling away from his love for the Israelites and falling away from his love from God. And he's, he's doing that because I suppose I could say because of somebody else's intransigence and somebody else's error that he finds himself in a position where he feels he has no recourse but literally to go back to his enemies. And often we do that, don't we? We find ourselves in places where we find solace in the things of the world rather than seeking the things of God. Rather than and I'm sure in many occasions David would have prayed for Saul. I doubt if Saul had prayed for David, but I think David would probably have prayed for Saul, although I don't want to add that to the scripture. But just with the very heart of the man, it would appear that Saul was bent on David's death, and David was almost bent on reconciliation. I mean, he lived like a wild animal out in the desert. He should have been in the palace. He should have been the king's son-in-law. He should have been the head of the army. And yet here he was. And is it any wonder sometimes he, he wondered why, God, where are you in this? I should be king of Israel. I should be at least up there somewhere in the palace with my wife and my family and enjoying friends, protecting the people. And here I am out in the desert. And I think he got to the point where he was so fed up, he decided, I'll go and seek solace with the Philistines. The one thing I do know is that Saul's frightened of the Philistines. And if I go and live with them, at least I'll get Saul off my back. So we find him going to Achish, who's the king of the Philistines. And the last time he went, of course, Achish threw him out. David was on his own trailed up to the gate of Gath with, with Goliath's sword and a few loaves of bread and literally nothing else. And of course, Goliath was from Gath and here he is with Gath's sword. And, you know, they were going to kill him. Achish was going to kill him because the Philistines hated David. David had done such damage to him. And yet David then pretended to be off his head. We know that he started to and slaver into his beard and scribble things in the walls and, and look at people with strange looks and, and eventually Achish says get him out of here you know I've got enough mad men in my court I'll just get rid of him and so he left there and of course the story goes on from there about him in the cave which we've looked at already but here he was back but this time he's back with 600 men at his back and by this time they're well seasoned warriors this is a big group of people and Achish is quite prepared to accept him because as we go on into chapter, the chapters 29 and 30 later on in, in the study we'll find that Achish was planning to attack the Israelites and if David was out of the picture then his chances of success were fairly good because Saul was not a particularly good commander at this point in time Although he had been a fearless commander when the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, he had lost his courage when the Spirit of the Lord had left him. So David went to Achish and stayed with him. And David went raiding on a daily basis, it would appear, or maybe twice a week or whatever they did. And they were raiding, and every time he came back, Achish was asking him, so where did you raid today? Oh, he says, I, I hit them down in the Negev and I hit the Judites over here and I, and I did this and I did that. And it was all lies. David actually fought against the enemies of Israel and plundered them. But he put himself in such a place with this lie that it literally tells us that he had to kill every man and woman and child that they raided, every village and town that they raided in case they came back to Achish and he found out the truth that he wasn't raiding the Israelite villages he was raiding the enemies of Israel, the friends of the Philistines, if you want to call it that. But nobody could prove it because nobody was left alive to know about it. So that's somewhere, I mean, we can't really condone David for doing that. That's where lies take you. He tells the lie, and then at the end of the day, he has to back up that lie. And he backs it up with terror and death and indiscriminate killing. And sometimes that's where it can lead us. Maybe not to that extent, but 
one lie has to be backed up by another lie, backed up by another lie. So, I say this to you this morning, if you want to tell lies, make sure you've got a good memory. Otherwise, uh, beware your sins will find you out. So, we find that David was given a town, Ziglag, to look after. That was one of the Philistine towns. Now, Philistia is basically, if you think of a modern map with the Gaza Strip, and a wee bit more to the eastern side and a wee bit more to the south into the Sinai. That was the kind of Philistine area. And, and Ziglag was just sort of in the middle of that. And so this went on and Achish accepted what David was telling him. In fact, right at the end of chapter 27 he says there, Achish trusted David and he said to himself, he has become so odious to his people, the Israelites, that he will be my servant forever. There'll be nowhere, nowhere back for David because he's told the lies to the Philistines. The Philistines have believed the lie and uh, they're quite happy to accept. Achish is quite happy to say, well, you know, he's attacked so many Israelites that they'll just, uh, that David will be mine forever. I'll have control over him. Little does he know that it's far from the truth. And so we get to one of the more interesting chapters, chapter 28. In those days the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, You must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. So David was being basically a mercenary army attached to the Philistines. David said, Then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. Achish replied, Very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now, Achish was making him a bodyguard, but you know, somebody once said that keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. And that in some measure is what Achish is doing here. If I keep David really close, I'll be able to keep a real eye on him and see what he's up to. You know, because obviously he doesn't quite totally trust him at this point in time. Now Samuel was dead at verse 33, and I think that's quite interesting. We've spoken about Samuel's death before, but Samuel was dead and all Israel mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. And Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. Samuel was dead. There was no spiritual leadership. People were beginning to do what they wanted to do. Even David had departed for what basically I think God would have wanted him to do. He was somewhere in the permissible will of God, but he certainly wasn't in the perfect will of God. And so we find that there was no real spiritual leadership in the land at this time. So at verse 4, the Philistines assembled and came up to set camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. And when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid, and terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or rumour or prophets. Then Saul said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium, so that I may go and inquire of her. So this was a very aggressive move on behalf of the Philistines. They were moving up to literally within three or four miles of where Saul was camped. And it was a real, this was a, this was a very aggressive move. This just wasn't a sort of, you know, a raiding party. This was an army, a full army. And Saul looked at this army and he was terrified. He was terrified because he had no trust in God anymore. He was terrified by what he could see with his eyes. In the very same way that he was terrified when he looked upon Goliath at that point in time. Remember all those years ago. And yet David looked with the eyes of faith. Saul looked with the eyes of the flesh. When Saul saw their army, he was afraid and terror filled his heart. And he inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or by the Urimim and the Thummim. We've spoken about that before. Or the prophets. There, was, there were obviously some prophets in the land, but nobody could bring him a word that he wanted to hear. Maybe the prophets were telling him, you're going to be beaten here, Saul. You better get yourself ready. But Samuel wasn't here. Samuel was always one that he had turned to. And so he said to his attendants, rather than say to his attendants, let's see what's wrong here. Let's see what we've got wrong in our life here. Let's see if we can come before the Lord and beseech him. Let's repent of our sinfulness and see if God will once again speak to us. 
You know, God will not speak to us if we're standing in a sinful place. I know that God speaks to sinners, yes he does, and we're all sinners. But we as Christians, when we put ourselves into a sinful situation, God will not speak to us to get us out of it until we repent of it. We have to say, Lord, I'm in the wrong place, I'm doing the wrong thing, help me. And when we do that genuinely, God will genuinely help you. But what help can God give us when we stand defiantly against him and say, well, I'm not really caring what you say, Lord. I'm not doing it your way. I'm doing it my own way. So be careful. Sometimes when we get ourselves in that dry place, it's because we're in a place where we've put ourselves in a dry place and we have to re-examine where exactly we are and what we're doing. So rather than seek that repentance, seek further the things of God, Saul says, find me a woman who is a medium. It's quite interesting this, and I don't mean this in a bad sense, but he didn't say find me a man who is a medium. He said find me a woman who is a medium. You know, if you've ever looked at spiritist meetings, 95% of them are women. Why? Well, I could tell you that right in the beginning that Eve was deceived. Samuel, uh, Adam stepped into his sin knowingly. He knew he was sinning. But Eve sinned through being deceived by Satan. And I think that sometimes women are more they're more in touch with the spiritual side of things than us guys are. We tend to be a bit standoffish in these things. But women tend to be more in touch with the spiritual side of things. And I think that's really what the situation is here. Saul had never actually come across a man who was a medium. The bulk of them that he saw were women. And so he asks, find me a woman who is a medium so that I may go and inquire of her. This, the same man who, when he was walking with the Lord, had expelled all the mediums and spiritists from the land. They have got no place here. Get them out of here. And so Saul disguised himself in verse 8, putting on other clothes. And at night, he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. So Saul's going at this full pelt. And we need to be very careful, guys. We can't get involved in these things. There's so many occultish practices that, that people do for fun. Things like Ouija boards and tarot cards and spiritist meetings and I mean, at the end of the day, we're going to see a couple of examples here of things that will lead us into real big problems. The woman said to him at verse 9, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Now she obviously doesn't know who she's talking to. Saul's in disguise. She's been approached by probably one of these two men that are with Saul. But she still realises, you know, this could be a sting operation. I could be getting set up here. They know I'm a medium and I could end up losing my life out of this. And here we have a situation where, in verse 10, Saul swore by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. He invokes the name of the Lord in this situation. I mean, what regard has he for the Lord at this point in time that he would actually bring God into this situation and yet you know in many spiritist meetings that that I've never been in but people have told me about the name of Jesus is never mentioned but they talk about God but what God it is I'm not really very sure it's just a total deception and to be fair most of the mediums and spiritists that are around they're just charlatans but there can be a demonic influence there and we're maybe going to see something here. I'm going to put two scenarios forward to you here and see what you think. And Saul swore to her, you'll not, be, you'll not be killed as long as sure as the Lord lives. Then the woman said, who shall I bring up? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said, Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. And the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a spirit coming up out of the ground. What does he look like, he asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up. You know, and every time I read that, I think, is the robe there with the torn hem? 
<coughs> and Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul bowed to the ground and prostrated himself. And so we've got a situation here where this woman, this medium, now, I quite believe there's, there's a couple of scenarios here. We can either see this as being some sort of demonic apparition, or we can see it as actually being Samuel here. Now, the demonic apparition, if we go on to read further, there would be no motive behind that. I mean, I'm always, I'm always swinging between the two opinions. To me, there is no motive behind the demonic apparition because Samuel goes on to tell Saul what the future holds for him. And that's something that really Satan doesn't know. Satan never knew what the future held for Jesus, but he wanted him on the cross. He thought, if I get him on the cross, that'll be an end to him. So he didn't know what the future was otherwise. He wouldn't have been so helpful. Saul recognises Samuel, recognises his voice. It would appear initially that the woman was the only one who'd seen it. And, and if she was in touch with a familiar spirit, as they talk about in spiritualism or spiritists, they would recognise the spirit that they were talking to, but she was terrified. This was something totally different. This was something that she couldn't handle. She was absolutely shocked. Now, I put this forward to you. Here's the other scenario. This was God at work. Just in the same way as in the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus stood there, Moses and Elijah appeared beside him. God had allowed them to come back and stand beside Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. In the same way, I believe by the work of the Holy Spirit that God just might have allowed Samuel to go back and appeal to Saul because at the end of the day, Saul was listening to no one. And sometimes if we don't listen to God, God might use some unfamiliar and uncomfortable ways to tell us his truth. Now, whichever one of these, you can make, you can make one or the other a case for one or the other. I keep flipping, I keep thinking, you know, it's a demonic apparition, and then I think, you know, why would Satan want Samuel to appear? And why would, why would Samuel, why would Samuel obey Satan? Samuel wasn't in a place where, Samuel was in Abraham's bosom at this point in time. Why would he obey a command from the evil demonic world? I can quite happily believe here, although it's quite difficult to get your head around, that God at the end of the day allowed Samuel to go and say, sort this out. Why have you disturbed me? I was in a good place, says Samuel. I was having a ball. I was with all the, the righteous dead at this point in time. I was with all the people. They probably weren't in heaven. They were in Abraham's bosom, as the Jews talk about, waiting for Christ, to, the redeeming blood, to bring them into heaven. But he was in a good place. He was loving it. Why have you brought me back? Why have you asked to see me? I am in great distress, says Saul. The Philistines are fighting against me and God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me. He no longer answers me by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. And basically, he says, Samuel says to him, Why do you consult me? Now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy. In other words, if God won't talk to you, why are you asking me? Am I God that you should consult me? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbours, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord to carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. So it's a, you know, we think, gosh, that was a while ago, the Amalekites. The Amalekites who had fought against the Israelites when they came up out of the land of Egypt. And God had promised then to destroy them. And God had given the task to Saul to destroy them. But remember, when Saul was given the task to do it, he didn't do it. He allowed the king of the Amalekites to live, Agag. And he took sheep and cows and things. And of course Samuel said to him, he says, Why have you not done what the Lord asked you to do? And Saul said, But I have done it. 
I'll, I've wiped out the Amalekites and I've wiped out all their animals. He says, well, what is this? I hear them bleating the sheep. And God held it against Saul. It was a sin for which Saul never repented. Don't think, and I don't want to be discouraging this, I want to encourage you, God is a holy God, a righteous God, a just God. He will never bring justice upon you that you don't deserve. And that's the situation that Saul finds himself in here. He was asked to do something and do it completely, and he only half did it. And he expected God to be happy with it. And so we've got a situation here where this is why Saul was being taken. Irrespective of how old the sin is, if we don't turn to the Lord and repent of our sin, if we don't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, then that sin will be held against us. Time will not soften it, and time will not make it any lesser a sin than it was in the first place. God is outside the time. He doesn't, he doesn't look at time in the way we look at it. We think, oh well, I did that. I was a Christian at the time, but you know, I did it 20 years ago. But you know, it really wasn't my fault. If there's any conscience that bothers you, if the Holy Spirit is pricking your life with something that happened, whether you were a Christian or not, then deal with it. Don't allow your sin to stand unforgiven, because then you just might find that God will not speak to you. Not speak to you in the way that he should. Not speak to you in the way that he wants to. But he's constantly interceding for you to say. Helping you to, to get that sin forgiven. To get that slate wiped clean. We can't stand against a holy God. We might think this is unjust. This, is, this was a while ago. But sin doesn't decline because of time. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground filled with fear because of Saul's words, Samuel's words. His strength was gone for he had eaten nothing at all that day and night. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your maidservant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so that you may eat and have the strength to go on your way. In other words, it's a flowery way of saying, I'll give you something to eat to sin then beat it. I don't, I don't want you here anymore. I, I'm, I'm abs- I mean, she was terrified by the whole situation. Didn't want to be involved. It had gone wrong. This guy Samuel had come up. She'd found out that this was Saul, the king. And she did not want to know. And yet, she had some sympathy for Saul. I'll give you something to eat. And you can go on your way. And he refused and said, I will not eat. But his men joined the women in urging him. And he listened to them and he got up from the ground and sat on the couch. You know, when Saul went to consult this medium, he asked his attendants to go and find him a woman who was a medium. If attendants and friends are anything that they should be, they should have said to Saul, you can't do that, Saul. This is wrong. You can't go consulting spiritists and mediums it's just totally ungodly we're in a bad enough situation and you're going to make it ten times worse and Saul breaks out by by blaming God in some measure well God's not speaking to me I don't hear God's voice in my life so if he doesn't want to speak to me then I'll go another place and find somebody who will speak to me and we see the same thing happening here with Saul as happened to David David has fallen back fallen away from the Lord in the sense that he's gone back with the the Philistines, back into the world. And Saul has done exactly the same thing. This whole situation between Saul and David has produced many, many casualties, both physically, emotionally and spiritually. And in some measure, Saul and David would be two of them. Saul would end up dead physically and possibly spiritually. But David had a long way back to come before he got himself re-established in the right place that he should be with the Lord. These are the things that happen sometimes in life. David and Saul, although they were great friends to start with, they weren't great friends for long. And then one started to go astray, and because of his going astray, started to lead others astray. David never refused to speak to Saul. Do you notice that in all the time 
Never once did he, did he stand back and say, well, I'm just going to have nothing to do with Saul anymore. He always tried to make a difference. We give that to, Saul, uh, to David as a plus point. Saul was definitely considered and killing him in every situation, but David always wanted to make the difference. He always wanted to make the reconciliation. You know, Jesus was the same with the Pharisees, irrespective of what they said to him. He always tried to make a difference with them. Even when they tried to kill him. He still went to the synagogue every Saturday or every seventh, sixth day or seventh day or whatever it was they did. And he tried to reason with them. He tried to tell them, you've got it wrong, you need to change. And all it did was infuriate them even more. And that was the same with David. David tried his very best with Saul to tell him, Saul, you've got this wrong. I've done nothing against you. I want what's best for you. And yet Saul was determined that David should die. And so, watch out for our relationships here. Watch out that we don't push people into a place where hatred and lies and destruction come out of it. We get ourselves into places where we get tied up in sinful things and we refuse to repent because we don't think it's wrong or we don't or we think other people are wrong. But be careful because Saul ended up a madman, really. He ended up totally paranoid against David. And David in some measure ended up wandering around the desert for possibly ten years waiting for some sort of reconciliation with Saul and from God. So let's not be like that. Let's try and make that reconciliation with the people that we know that we have issues with. Let's not try and be the souls. All we want to do is go out and destroy people because we think they're worth destroying. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you and praise you for this good day, Lord. I know that that's a bit of a downbeat on the on the study today, Lord, but we do have certain situations, Lord, where we find ourselves in that the people stand against us and yet, Lord, we have to try and be the better person. We have to be the Christian, Lord. We have to show the different way. So help us to do that, Lord. If there are situations in our lives in the past where we have uh, where we haven't repented properly of what we've done, Lord, then help us to do that. Because we want to stay on track with you, Lord. We don't want uncomfortable occurrences in our life, Lord, and unconventional things to happen to us, Father, just because we won't listen to you. So we just ask that you would bless us this day as we part. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.